Let's pray together. Lord, you are great. You are so great and so good and so magnificent. And Lord, as we open your word, open our eyes that we would see and understand and that relationships would be transformed and futures would be changed all for your glory because you are God and you are worthy. And we will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me invite you, if you would, please, to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Two weeks ago, Pastor Jason did a masterful job on talking about husbands loving their wives like Christ loved the church. And he had three main points. He talked about sacrificial love, sanctifying love, and scriptural love for his wife. That's what men we are to have. And he mentioned at that time that I might have a few things to say to the men, and I do. <laughs> I, am, I am passionate that men would be godly men. That if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that your life would be transformed by what God says and, and the kind of man that God wants you to be. And so we're going we're gonna to speak to this issue. Because there's, there's a problem in, in that the, the men of this world, we need to be men that are godly men and who do what God has called us to do and to, and to be. And so we're going we're gonna to study God's word. I'm, I'm calling this um, spiritual chivalry, but chivalry is the quality idealized by knighthood such as bravery, courtesy, honor, and gallantry towards women. And yet I want it to be spiritual. I want you to be Holy Spirit energized. I want our wives and future wives to be the happiest ladies in uh, the world because they have been live, loved in a biblical way. And so we, we don't see a lot of good models of that. Back in the day on TV, you would have, even though they didn't necessarily live it out in life, but you had good role models that were on TV. You had Ward Cleaver. You had, you had Bill Cosby who... Um, who lived out lives where they, they were good men, they were family men, they, they were caring for their wife, they were considerate. But nowadays, you look at, at what is portrayed as the model of what a man should be and what a man is, and it's a, it's a joke. It really is a joke. Even in commercials, whether it is a Doritos commercial or a beer commercial, men are portrayed as lazy and clueless and hormonally driven and immature and selfish and incompetent and stupid. And don't get me wrong, men can be that. I, I get it. But we were, yeah, never saying amen, yeah. We were dead in our transgressions, but now we're alive. And so God wants us as men to be different. And even, even the secular world is getting sick of this. This was on a, a news network where it says, Dads to media, stop playing us as idiots because um, God has called us to be different. We, we don't want to be conformed to the pattern of this world. We, we want to be transformed. And so let me invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. And I'm going to read verse 25 all the way to the end of verse 33 of Ephesians chapter 5. It says, Husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, so that she may be holy and without blemish in the same way. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. You may be seated. 
So again, last week, or two weeks ago, sacrificial love, sanctifying love, and scriptural love. And today, we're going to get super practical, and we're going to look at how that works its way out. And um, this is one that I hope people will talk about. I really do. I've been praying that, that lives would be changed, marriages would be changed because of what God's Word says. So, how exactly is a husband to love his wife? Well, we have the answer in verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. So men, how do you love your body? Oh, we do. We care for it. We baby it. We protect it. If you're cold, you put stuff on. If you're hot, you, you do what you can to get yourself cooled down. If you're hungry, you feed it. You protect it. You guard it. You do, you do cherish your body. We all do. And the scripture is very clear. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. We don't, we don't like when we're embarrassed. We don't like when we're put down. We don't like when we um, are interrupted in our agenda. The very fact that we have meltdowns when things don't turn out the way we want it to be is the very fact that we, we love ourselves. We love our plan. We love our lives. And how dare you cut in my way when I'm trying to get on the highway? That's why there's road. I mean, it really makes no sense. But we do it. We love it. And it says in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So let's picture this for a second. Let's say this podium represents my wife. I love myself. I show it in a million ways. If I'm hungry, anything I want, I do for myself. If I need a break, I give myself a break. And he's saying to us, men, you're one. Love your wife as yourself. So the idea of saying, well, I'm just thinking of me. There's no me. There's you. And, and your love needs to extend to her and you treat her the way you want to be treated. It's that simple. And people say, well, I hate myself. I don't really love myself. Even that self-hate is love gone weird. That's all it is. Blaise Pascal has said, said this. All men seek happiness. This is without exception. With diff whatever means they employ, they tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it. Is th it is the same desire in both, attendant with different views. The, this will never take the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of man, even those who hang themselves. So everybody wants to be happy. Everyone wants to be, we love ourselves. And so I'm saying this to you men. Whether you are married, whether you're, you're young and you're single and you're not married yet, you're a kid, I'm speaking to the young ladies because the man you want to eventually marry needs to be following this pattern should be following the biblical example. I'm saying this to, to older ladies who maybe have been married before and they're looking for a spouse and, they, and they're wondering what they should be looking for. God's pattern is real clear of how men are to act. And really, we're, uh, we're, to, we're to love ourselves. Uh, you know, Jesus said, so whatever you wish others would do to you, so do to them. This, this is really a very clear, simple statement that men, look at your wife as, par, as an extension of yourself and demonstrate that in word, attitude, and action. One of the things we're going to do before we leave, we're going to give you an assignment as couples to say, to go home and look at this. Because I know within any church service, there are marriages that are going just fine, and then there's others that are struggling, and we're going to try to deal with, with some of these things. One of the questions that I received three weeks ago was on the, 
when, when I was dealing with a submission, here's what the question was uh, emailed in or texted in. What does this look like on a daily basis? Is it in every situation? Or whether we, whether we go out or eat or not? Or is it only the bigger decisions of life? Well, if you look at this and you put it all together, if a husband is loving his wife like Christ loved the church, then, then a lot of those daily situations are being worked out. They're being talked through. They're on the same page. And, and yes, there are times when they don't agree and it does come down to the, the man who is the head of the home. God's called us that we are the head of our homes and yet we're to take into consideration our wives as we would our very own thoughts and we're to love them like Christ loved the church. And so it is going to seem seamless. It is going to seem um, very natural because when I love myself, I make decisions that make me happy and, and what is best for me. And husbands, in the same way, you are to love your wives. This is revolutionary. This changes everything. It, it does. And so submission doesn't look like it's a slavish thing. It, it's a joy because you're being treated well and honored and cared for as a man does his own body. Because we do. We love and cherish it. I've, I've been moving the last couple of weeks and yesterday I'm, I'm working on a gutter and um, I, I just... It's just not good for me to do that stuff. But anyways, I, I pinched my finger, and I said, yeah, cowboy. No, that's not what I said, but I didn't, I didn't cuss. But I mean, I'm like, I'm like, ow, ow, and I'm holding it, and I'm kissing it, and I'm cherishing it, and I'm like going, oh, why? Because I love myself. And it was just a fresh reminder of how I need to love and care for my wife. Now, point B, the motivation for a husband to love his wife let me just read it again. For no, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. We, we're, we're one with him. It says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one in spirit with him. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. And when you understand the gospel, men, this is why we do this. This is why we love our wives like Christ of the church. Because we're, we are, we're one with him. We are, we are his children. We are his representatives. We are the picture of Christ's love for the church. We have the high privilege as believers of sacrificially loving our wife just like Christ has done for us. And that, and that works its way out in word, attitude, and action. Because you could say it all day long. But if it's not working its way out, then, then we have issues. I, I'd say this again. I plead with every single girl, woman, you want a man that's going to live this out. Marriage is hard enough. The divorce rate, even amongst those that call themselves Christians, they say is around 50%. And it is truly impossible unless we have the Lord working in us to will and to do his good pleasure and so you want to make sure that you marry well. I was talking to ladies after the first service, and they, they, were, they were there. It's like, that was, that was a good message. You know, unfortunately, we wish we would have heard this like 20, 30 years ago. And so we, are, we, we have this model. This is why we do it. Point C, the church, Christ and the church illustrate the love of a husband for his wife. And there are several tentacles to this. But let me, let me read verse 31. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now every one of these that I'm going to talk about here could be a sermon. But let's, let's start with this. First of all, God's design for marriage 
a man shall leave his father and hold and and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two become one flesh. It's a quote of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. So God's standard for marriage is one man and one woman unified together as one for all of life. That's the definition of marriage. It started in Genesis. Paul reiterated it. Jesus reiterated it. And it has not changed today. Even though in our land, marriage is defined otherwise. But in our statement of faith, we affirm that marriage is between one man and one woman only. And by God's grace, this church will always stand for that truth. Though there are churches around us all around that are falling and they're putting their finger to the wind and say, well, I guess if the culture says it's different, then we're going to change. You can't. John Piper has said this, and I I love this quote. He said, God designed marriage to display Christ's covenant to his bride, the church. To celebrate a brideless union as marriage is to distort and deface the parable of the most beautiful act in the world. And he goes on to say, God has defined marriage as a covenantal union for life between a man and a woman as husband and wife. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. That's God's plan. That's his design. And it's a glorious design. It really is. Now, there's a second, second tentacle. There is the concept of leaving and cleaving, the cleaving and cleaving of marriage. A man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two become one flesh. See, at a, at a wedding ceremony, typically the dad walks his daughter down this aisle and they stop right there, right in front there. And he's all teary-eyed and will say, Who gives this woman to be married to this man? And he'll say something like, I do, or my wife and I do, or he'll he'll mumble something through his tears, and then he'll take her hand and place it in his hand. He will kiss her, and he will go, and he will sit down right there. And they will walk up. And that that is a picture of the leaving that takes place. No longer is he under... Her authority, his authority. Now, now, it is that man's responsibility, the new husband, to love and care for and protect his wife till death, till they part. And the problem is that umbilical cord sometimes does not get cut. And so parents will meddle and they're going to, they, they try to, you know, get involved, and don't get me wrong, I'm all about giving advice, but I will often say to Josh and Susie, I'll say, I'll say to Josh, Josh, you're the man of the house, you guys pray about it, it's your decision. We'll give you counsel all day long. But how sad it is, and I, and I see it all the time, where, where dad will, will pull the strings, or mom will pull the strings, or, or the, uh, the husband's mom and dad, they'll, they'll, they'll pull something. You know, they'll try to manipulate with finances. Stop that. Yes, help them all you can, but let them leave and let them cleave. And so I say that to the, to the older ones where your kids are getting married or just getting married or will be married down the road. You've got to let them go. You've got to let, let the man be the man in the house. Yes, offer the help, but it's ultimately a leaving and cleaving that needs to happen. It literally means, in the Greek, it, it, it's the idea of gluing, cementing together as husbands and wives come together and they set up a new union that is there. There's another part to this passage, and that is the oneness of marriage. And as I looked at this, I could have, this is another one, I could have spent the whole message on this. I, as I was studying this, I was reminded of different uh, seminars that we had gone through and uh, different things that I have read over the years, and I, I re-looked up some of those things. This whole becoming one, the two becoming one flesh. And as, 
more than just physically. It's in, it's in every way, the oneness of marriage, the leaving and the cleaving. And yet within that, it's like two nations. Here's what happens. When, when a husband and wife come together, he's coming from a certain tribe with all kinds of background and baggage and all kinds of issues, and so is she. And they come together and they blend and they make this, they're called to be one. He is to love her as Christ loves the church and he is to love her as he loves himself. They become one. This is a glorious union that is there. In uh, Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, a, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So as he leads his wife and they become one and they draw near to the Lord, that cord of three strands is not easily broken. And yet I got to tell you this, there's a devil and the way he wrecks marriages is, is he gets in between and he breaks the oneness. Right now, if, if your marriage is encountering any difficulty, it's because there's a threat to your oneness. The devil wants to divide you. Because why? If he, if he can make your marriage fall apart, then the picture of Christ's love for the church, it becomes a joke. And by the way, that's what's happened, even in Christian marriages. And so people, people don't look at marriage as anything special, just two people that love each other. It's far more than that. So what are, these, what are these threats to oneness? Well, the threats are actually pretty clear. Being on a different page spiritually. I mean, this goes back to when, you know, and again, I, I will plead with young people, make sure that you, not only do you marry someone who more than just says they're a Christian, make sure that they love the Lord, that they're walking with the Lord. And even then, there, there's no guarantee because he's got be, to be doing that, but... Sometimes they're in a different, different page spiritually. And, and there's a threat that's there. Especially when the man will not be the spiritual head of his home as he should be. You should have a common mission to glorify the Lord. So when, when that's off, there's a threat to oneness. Because he or she won't want to go to church. Or they won't, won't want to do anything spiritual. They won't want to honor the Lord. They won't want to serve. Then you, then you have... The, the breach of your vows, the, the, the breach covenant that you made, whether it is by abandonment or dishonesty or betrayal or, or adultery, whether it's, it's actual or pornography, those things break that oneness. It's a threat. I, I, I always used to say to men, you know, where I used to, when I was a young man, we had to go to 8 Mile and Woodward to see things before I knew Jesus. Nowadays, you pick up your phone, it's right there. And you've got to battle against that. And you've got to guard against that. The, the, another threat is, is unforgiveness. I mean, let's face it. We, we hand out a book to people that are contemplating marriage, or really, we give it to a lot of people. It's called When Sinners Say I Do, because that's exactly what, what's going on. When two people get married, they are two sinners that come into the, to the union. They become one. But none of us are perfect. And so we do sin. And so what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to forgive. You're going to have to forgive as the Lord's forgiven you. It, in, and unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. You know, we, we, say, we say that we forgive but then we, we hold on to the baggage. You can't. The Lord doesn't do that to you. He doesn't sit there and say, oh, I forgive you, but you're in the penalty box because look what you did. He has taken it. He's removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. There's a couple more threats to oneness, and that is child-centered parenting. This particularly happens when people have children later in life. And that child, that child becomes the center of everything. And, you, and, and within that union, mom and dad just live their lives circling and they're no longer one. Can I just say this? The, the relationship of the husband and wife come before the parent or before the children. Yes, you got to care for the kids. But you got to keep the oneness there. Kids are little terrorists that will divide your, your life they will. I talk to couples who 
who haven't had a date. They haven't had a date. Oh, because, oh, little junior needs, he needs, your little junior's going to be just fine without you. You know, trust someone, build a relationship, and, and you know, and if you say, well, I, I just can't, I can't pay a babysitter, talk to me. I'll help you. It, it's, it's so sad that relationships struggle because they, oh, the child, the child, the child. Yeah, yeah, let me tell you, I'm an empty nester now. Empty nesting is glorious. It is glorious. Those kids, they do, they, they grow up and they go. And you want to model for them that, you know what, you're going to be out of this nest soon and you're going to make wise decisions. And yes, you mentor and you do all those things. But there's going to come a day, you know, and sometimes it's the, the helicopter mom and sometimes it's the, the dad that, oh, you know, can't let my little girl go. You got to let him go. And you, and you model that while you're young. And you let them know that they're not the center of the universe. So go out. And men, if you have not been on a date with your wife in the last month, shame on you. Go. You're the spiritual leader. Take her on a date. And if you say, we have no money, talk to me. Because I got like a million free dates that you can do. Won't cost you a penny. But you can go out and have a lot of fun together. And you connect again in that oneness. You have to do that. Children will rule your life if you let them. And then you get them involved in sports and travel this, and next thing you know, you're... you're, you're and the, the last threat to oneness, and this is probably the, the greatest danger, is parallel living, which includes the children, includes the job, includes... It, it's kind of like, yeah, you get married and everything's great, and then all of a sudden you just kind of grow apart. And he's doing his things and she's doing her things... And you are like two ships that are flying at night. You know, you don't run into each other. You don't come close. It's like, oh. I mean, you might spend a little time, but there's no oneness. There's no husband loving his wife like he loves his own body. And it's so easy to get living parallel lives with work and, and the distractions of life to where you're, you don't even talk anymore. And when you talk, it's about the kids or about this or about that. It's like, no, you got to get together. You got to talk. You got to have fun. You got to communicate. I mean, really, when's the last time you, you just had fun? For some, it's been decades. And so, men, you need to, you need to lead in this. You need to love your wife like Christ loved the church. And, and show it in word, attitude, and action. And you talk and you communicate and you live life together. And yes, there's intimacy together. Yes. And, and you do it for the glory of God and you do it because he has called you to be a picture of Christ's love for the church. Christ doesn't sit there and say, okay, church, you're over there and I'm over here and, and we're not talking. He walks with us. He, he's, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. There's one last thing that I see in this passage, and that is the, the permanence of marriage. In, in Mark 8.10, it says, and the, two, and the two shall be one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. It is till death do you part. Divorce, brothers and sisters, is not to be a word in your vocabulary. And I get, I get it for some of you. It's like, I wish I would have heard this 15, 20 years ago. But for those that are here, it's not in their vocabulary. Not. Because, because what can happen is it can get so rough sometimes that you just want to hit the eject button. And you don't. You get the help. Pastor Jason and I are here there's, there's help to be had. And everyone says, you know, the funny thing, everyone comes to church and everyone thinks, oh, everyone's great, everyone's great. Can I tell you? Everybody struggles. No one's great all the time. Believe it or not, Jane and I, every now and then, we don't, we don't get along. But we talk it through, but, and you've got to work it through, and you've got to repent, and you've got to understand that God has said, this is till death do we part. He says in verse 33, 
This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. What is, why, what is that language? Why does he say mystery? A mystery was something that was hidden in the past. And in specific here, the whole concept of Christ's love and his church, it was, it was hidden in the past. But in the New Testament, when Christ came, marriage is a sanctified reflection of the magnificent and beautiful mystery of the union between Jesus the Messiah and his glorious bride, the church. And that was not known until Christ came. And, and guess what? Does Jesus leave his bride? Nope, he doesn't. And you say, well, you don't know my wife. She's a headache. Well, let me tell you, we as the church, we're not good. We are, we are wretches as his bride sometimes. And he does not leave us. He loves us. He cares for us. And gentlemen, that is how we are to love our wives. And this, this union we have here is, is solid. And God hates divorce. Now, I was going to uh, talk about the whole verse 33 where it says, let each, each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that he respects she respects her husband, but there's too much there. Pastor Jason's going to deal with that next week and, as he likes to say, and clean up anything that I've messed up. But I, what I want to do, I want, I want us to look at this and, and really just reflect. And, and here's your assignment when you go home. I want you to sit down as couples for those of you that are married. And men, I want you to lead this. And if they're not leading it, ladies, I give you the permission to, to step into this. But man, I want you to ask the question, how, how are we doing in our oneness? How, how am I doing as a husband? Am I loving you as I'm loving myself? Now, ladies, be gracious, because I get it. There's 50 things we can work on. Give us one, two, maybe three. And if, and if, you, know, and if you know your guy's sensitive, give him one. You know, let him work on one. But men, I'm begging you, don't let the world pull you apart. It is so easy to do. And, and so, how, how are we doing, guys? For you young ones that are dating, is the person I'm dating, is, for the ladies, is, the, is that young man that I'm dating exemplifying what this means? And if he's not, run because there's a bunch of ladies that I could have you talk to today that would say, oh, I wish I would have married better. I wish I would have understood this before I got married. So look at your oneness. You know, is there, are we on the same page? Are there things that we need to clear the air on if, if there's been covenants breached? Am I, have I forgiven? Have, I, have we gone on a date or are we living around our kids I'm serious about that, especially for those when you have kids that are under the age of seven, you need date night. You need to talk about something more than your kids. Your kids are going to be there when you get back. And then, and then now you live in parallel. This is scary because it, it just happens like this. It, it, it starts off like this. It's like, oh, we're, you know, we're just busy. The next thing you know, it gets worse. The next thing you know, it gets worse. The next thing you know, you don't even know each other. Then when the kids leave the nest, then you look at each other and it's like, I don't even know this person. And that does not have to happen, and it won't happen if you, man, are loving his, your wife as Christ of the church and you're, and you're spending time in that oneness. Then when emptiness comes, it's glorious. So bow your heads and just ask the Lord how you're doing on these issues.
Lord, you know every heart. And I, and I pray for everyone here. Young and old. Married and single. Lord, that you would be working. That we would see your word and your plan and your design. I pray for men that they would model and mentor and coach and live out what it means for a husband to love his wife as he loves his own body and cherish it and nourish it just like you do for us. Lord, I pray for those that have been threatened and attacked by the threats to oneness, that they would get on the same page spiritually, that that the breaches in the covenant would be mended, that there would be unforgiveness that would be forgiven, that there would be parenting that is done where it is Christ-centered and a couple unifying. And Lord, that, that we would not live separate lives, parallel lives, but that we would be one as you have called us to be. Lord, I know within this sanctuary there are, there are we, all, we all need help. So Lord, help us to humble ourselves. I pray that men would lovingly lead and be the men that you have called us to be. So change the course of generations to come, even this day, through your word. Lord, we need your help. And we will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, it's God's will that we, we step up. God's will that I step up. I love one of the lines in this song talking about the art of losing myself. How, I, how can I, it's going to require, man, it's going to require us losing ourselves a bit. To love our wives the way we need to. Why don't we all stand? And men, I'd like you to sing with me on the first, the first part of this. Men, sing with me. You will above all else, my purpose remains. The heart of losing myself in bringing you praise, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory. My heart and my soul, I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace, to love you from the inside out. I pray that our married ladies would be the happiest women on earth because they have been loved as you have loved us. Lord, I pray that we would be 
understanding your plan in life for marriage and for even relationships. Lord, give us a fresh start that we